The second thing I have to comment on, I hope you don't mind if I take a little point of privilege. Mr. Foreman said something during his void dire that I almost laughed out loud while he was doing it. He talks about how this was, you know, talks about the, how this is a, a sanctuary of justice. Well, if you look out front, it's called the Hall of Justice. And one day we're driving by and my middle son looks at me and says, is your office close to Batman? <laughs> there you go. We're going to do, uh, counsel, do you all want six or seven? Do you want an extra juror or do you want, do you want just six? We're going to get done today. Six. Just six? six. Are, are we going to get done today, do you think? I intend to. Okay. Well, six is fine. Enough. Six will be great. Ladies and gentlemen, if your name is called in the six, you have been selected to serve as a juror. Please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will impartially try the case between the parties and give a true verdict according to the evidence and the law in the case? So help you God. All right. Your jury has been sworn. You may be seated. Uh oh. Okay. I'm sorry. Judge, can I see my strike? Yeah. Same here. Okay. I don't think that's right. It okay. doesn't seem right. All right. Well, we can fix it, but we have to agree. So. Yeah. What did, did we call? <laughs> Same. Okay. So can we by agreement redo it? Well, that Absolutely. Uh, otherwise I have to give a mistrial and a start over. Oh, no, I don't uh, okay, so, yeah, I don't want that. Okay, so, all right, so you two talk, lead counsel, speak to her, and that way we can get you it lined up. Yeah. yeah, when you said, uh, when you said, Hall, when you, I can't remember what you called it, I thought, and Carson, Carson asked me one day, he goes, is your, is your temple in just, yeah, he goes, is your, is your office down the, down the hall, is your office closed to back, man? Are you in Louisville? Yeah. Do you know Casey, the call? Yeah. No shit. Yes, yeah. sir. He's on 600 West Jefferson, I believe, with yeah. uh, the rest of that crew. One of my yeah. um, former um, co-counsel in a lot of accident injury cases, uh, Vissar Malici. Okay. He's over there now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Casey, uh, Casey and I are big buddies. We, we still... Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay, so I, I'm going to excuse the one that was not. Okay, all right. So I won't have to re-swear them. I'll just excuse the one that didn't. Okay, there we go. <coughs> all right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think we had an extra juror stand up, and I apologize. It may have been when I said stand up. Only these six names are going to be on the jury, okay? Uh, so listen carefully. Jeffrey Dean, Kristen Guerrero, Sandra Ogle, John Herbs, Cindy Kelsey Payne, Brian Cox. If those six could please stand, I'll re-administer the other. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, counsel, is everybody satisfied? All right. Yes, Your Honor. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will impartially try the case before the parties give a true verdict according to the evidence and the law, so help you God? All right. So everyone, you may be seated, everyone except those six uh, are going to be excused just in here in just a minute. Again, on behalf of Robert Jennings and Charles Harden, my colleagues on the bench, I very much appreciate you all coming. I want to remind you um, that you need to call the jury line prior to the next day of service listed in your letter. If you need a new letter, please stop downstairs in Mr. Fernandez's office and get a copy of the letter. With that being said, the balance of the jury pool is excused with the thanks of the court.
Abi. Oh, you all like to see that. I'm so sorry. All right, this come off Kentucky ready to proceed to trial. Uh, Mr. Dotson, is he prepared to proceed to trial? Yes, sir. Counsel, you may. That's what I was going to ask you. I'm sorry. Oh, you're okay. Come on. I'm a creature of habit. So. And experience for me. All right, yes, sir. You may be heard. Um, just want to make sure that the court invokes the rule separation of witnesses. Okay. Any other motions that need, need to be made at this time? Um, Your Honor, you would reserve to rulings on our motions and when they related to uh, using the term legal limit and uh, issue of temporary evidence. That was last time. I don't know if the court wants well, to hear that again. So, I, 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 sort of, I sort of don't. It's, it's going to be in its... Uh, the issue of tampering is uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and let you all know that um, under uh, 401 and 403, I think that that is excluded under um, evidence that would prejudice, confuse, uh, confuse the jury. So we're not going to have any discussion about that whatsoever. Um, and I will put that in writing in the trial notes so you can certainly appeal that you know, if, if, you, if you want. Um, just so you know, I was a, I don't blame you, I was a defense lawyer and I would have tried to say the same thing. But, uh, but with that being said, I, I just think that's, uh, I think that's too far afield. Um, I believe it would confuse the jury and I'm not going to, we're not going to get into that today. But now, let me, let me say this. I am interested in seeing where it goes because, albeit during Boy Dyer, I will say that the Commonwealth actually brought up the issue of the legal limit, and I was a little surprised to hear that in light of uh, there was a discussion about what the legal limit was. Now, this is a per se, this is not a per se case, um, but there was a discussion that was brought up, and you, the Commonwealth asked specific. I wrote it down. Uh, I was kind of taken aback by it. Um, is it possible to be under the legal limit? Um, let's see. Is it possible to be 08 but not under the influence? So, I'm so sorry. Well, she said she said 08. Well, well, okay, I understand. So when we're not going to use the phrase legal limit, but if you want to talk about 08, that, that's perfectly fine because the one that brought it up. You're, you're right. You're 100 percent right. Didn't say under the legal limit. Didn't say over the legal limit. Talked about 08. Okay. And Judge, I would just say that it, 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 can't be, it can't be in the context of the law of the case that's brought up. Because yeah. we're not prosecuting this a is per not se. a per se case. I'm it, aware it, of that. It, I, it, I saw the it, it, it is not a per se case. So, you, you know, and I wouldn't even let them talk about 08 if, if, if it hadn't been brought up. So we're not going to use the phrase legal limit, but they open the door. Well, no, I mean, Within the confines of it not being a, a, a per se a per se case, certainly, I don't think you did anything wrong. It's just you all talk about it, so I'm going to let them um, let them use the phrase "oh wait." They can do that, but not legal limit. We're not talking about towing the line, going over the line, 
Um, what else did I used to argue? Tipping the line, tip, you know, tiptoeing up to the line, you know, none of that. I won't do any of that. Okay? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, if it is contemplated that you're going to be called as a witness in this trial, the motion to sequester the witnesses has been made and granted. You need to step outside at the direction of the bailiff. It is the responsibilities of the parties to ensure that their intended witnesses are not in this room. If they remain in the room after I have issued this order, they will not be permitted to testify. I assume that the Commonwealth um, will designate former Officer Salyer, Officer Salyer as the uh, uh, Commonwealth's agent. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Any other witnesses in this room need to step out now? All right. It is time now for opening statements. Commonwealth may proceed. Thank you. May it please the court? Yes, sir. Good morning. Oh. Anything else? You want to read one of the Oh, you all can sit wherever you want. Absolutely. I mean... I want the jury to sit wherever they want to sit. So if you all want to move up to the soft seat, you're welcome to do that. If you want to sit on the front row, you're welcome to do that. On any given day, I'd even let you sit in this seat, to be honest with you. That's okay. I see anything back there. All right. Better seat, isn't it? All right. Everybody comfortable? And that actually brings up something. Look, this is, this is not an endurance test. If at any time, for any reason, you all need either the parties or the, you know, like, like you can probably tell, I'm not feeling the best in the world. So if anybody needs a break, just get Chief's attention. He is your connection to me. Um, we will be happy to take a break for you at, at any given time. Just so you know, I usually take a break at lunch, uh, from uh, right at lunchtime uh, for about an hour, and then we'll come back and we'll work as long as it takes. Okay. So anything else we need to take up, Council? No, All right, Mr. T uh, Mr. Davis, on behalf of Commonwealth of Kentucky, you may proceed with your opening statement, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please yes. the court? Yes, sir. Mr. Foreman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. <coughs> Ms. Hahn introduced a uh, new member of the board of directors, Rodney Davis, on the Assistant County Attorney. We are here today because the defendant, Timothy Dotson, operated his motor vehicle in Madison County, Kentucky under the influence of alcohol. <coughs> this is my opportunity during the case to tell you what I think the evidence is going to be that's going to prove these charges beyond a reasonable doubt. What evidence are you going to see and what evidence are you going to hear? Okay? Well, what you're going to hear is from Officer Gerald Sacker. I call him Officer because I've known him for years and that's the only one I'm going to call him. He's moved on to other things in his uh, occupation. He's still an officer to me. Um, you're going to hear that on September the 28th of 2019, here in Richmond, the Richmond Police Department was conducting a traffic safety checkpoint on Lancaster Avenue, right up here. And that checkpoint was right near the intersection of Eastern Bypass, right in front of the Model Laboratory School. I'm sure everybody on the jury knows what that's at. At about 10.30 that night, Officer Salyer was stationed in the gas station that's on the corner of Barnesville Road and Lancaster Avenue, and he was watching the oncoming traffic coming from downtown up Lancaster toward the traffic safety checkpoint. He's going to tell you that at about 10.30, he observed the defendant's truck approaching the traffic safety checkpoint, at which time the truck made a reckless and erratic movement changing lanes without signaling. It almost struck a vehicle that was next to it, and then it took a quick turn on Eastway Drive before it got to the traffic safety checkpoint. Officer Sauer will tell you at that point that he initiated a traffic stop of the defendant's truck on Eastway Drive. When he approached the vehicle, Mr. Dotson was driving the truck and he made several observations as soon as he approached the vehicle. First, he noticed a strong smell of marijuana coming from the vehicle. He noticed that the defendant had extremely bloodshot and glassy eyes, and that his eyelids were drooping. Officer Sawyer also noticed that the defendant had slurred speech. So after he engaged the defendant, he'll tell you that he made the decision that he had 
defendant may have been operating his vehicle under the impairment of either drugs or alcohol. At that point in time, he made a determination that he was going to do a further investigation. You're never going to decide how you handle a defendant until you've done multiple things to make a determination on the right way to proceed. Officer Sawyer reported that at that point, after he spoke with the defendant, he had him exit the vehicle and he conducted what are a series of field sobriety exercises. And these are techniques that law enforcement is taught to determine whether someone is impaired either by drugs or alcohol or some substance. It doesn't have to be drugs or alcohol, it can be any substance. He, con he conducted a horizontal gaze and status test. He conducted a walk and turn exercise. And he conducted a one leg stand exercise. Now, I'm not sure if you've seen those on TV or you've seen them in the movie. The horizontal gaze and stagnus exercise is when the officer holds a finger or a pen and has the defendant track uh, with uh, their eyes the movement of the pen of the finger. Officer Shalia will tell you that these exercises give them what they call clues as to whether somebody's impaired. And he'll say on the horizontal gaze and stagnus exercise that the defendant clued twice, gave two clues of impairment. After that, he conducted the walk and turn test, uh, the walk and turn exercise. The walk and turn exercise is a procedure where you see it on TV. The defendant walks heel to toe in a line on the counter and then turns and walks back. Officer Shadi will tell you that the defendant clued three times on that exercise. Then he conducted a third exercise that's the one leg stand. And the one leg stand is just what it implies. The defendant stands with one foot raised from the ground for a period of time and counts. And they have to balance without swaying their arms or doing anything of that nature. He will tell you that the defendant clued four times on the one leg stand exercise. Now, I'll let him go into detail explaining what those clues are, but they primarily related to the defendant's inability to follow simple instructions and the defendant's inability to maintain balance, swaying, using the arms for balance, those type of things. Officer Sally will tell you that based upon the evidence to that point that he saw, the marijuana smell, the physical appearance of the defendant, and the clues from these field sobriety tests that he made the determination that the defendant was under the influence of drugs or alcohol. And he made the decision that he was going to arrest the defendant. After the defendant was arrested, Officer Shire inspected the defendant's truck. And inside that truck, he discovered two things that are important in this case. One, he discovered a Wendy's cup that had an alcoholic beverage in it. Uh, and it's a typical, you know, plastic Wendy's cup that you can think of when you go through Wendy's drive through And the other thing he discovered in the vehicle was marijuana residue. So based on those things, the defendant was arrested. He was charged with operating a motor vehicle under the influence of intoxicants in Madison County. He was charged with careless driving, charged with changing lanes without signaling, using your blinker and charged with uh, having an open alcoholic beverage in a motor vehicle. Once arrested, the defendant was transported to Baptist Health Emergency Room where a blood draw was taken. That blood was then sent to the Kentucky State Police Lab in Frankfurt for chemical analysis. And that was to determine whether or not there were drugs or alcohol or other substances in the blood. You're going to see a test today, or two tests actually, of that chemical analysis, and they show two things. And, and this is uh, objective proof. They show a 0 .069 uh, level for alcohol, a 0 .069 level for alcohol, and it shows three nanograms of delta-9 THC, marijuana. Delta-9 THC, you will be told, is the active ingredient of marijuana. That's the thing that causes the the high, for lack of a better word. So, the other evidence that you're going to hear as to the impact of these substances, both individually and in combination, is from an expert witness that the Commonwealth is going to call. 
you're going to hear from Michael Ward. Michael Ward is a chemist and forensic uh, scientist who's testified as an expert uh, all across Kentucky in these kind of cases. And he's going to give you his opinion <coughs> on a couple of things. He will tell you that he has reviewed the citation that was an issue to charge him back and the, the facts that he gleaned from that. And that he has looked at these two laboratory tests from the Kentucky State Police. And he's going to opine about a couple of things. He will give you the opinion that at a 0.069 alcohol level, a person would have an impaired ability to drive. They would either have slow reaction time, uh, an inability to maintain lines of travel, all those executive functions that you need to operate a motor vehicle, and that's why we have impaired driving lines, because we don't want to see people impaired doing that. The other thing he is going to tell you is that marijuana can be active and have an impairing effect for several hours after it's actually ingested. Now, there's a range, you know, of, of impact, but certainly it can have an impact on the ability to drive a vehicle for several hours after ingestion. He's going to tell you also that when you combine alcohol and you combine marijuana, that it can amplify the effects in someone's system. And again, it can cause an inability to drive effectively, an inability to maintain lanes, an inability to stop, stop, a stop and start doing all those types of things. And then finally, uh, Mr. Gordon is going to tell you that it's his uh, excellent opinion that the defendant's level of alcohol and marijuana in the system at the time he was actually operating the vehicle was actually higher than what it was at the time the blood was actually collected at the hospital. So in other words, the defendant's level of marijuana and alcohol was decreasing the farther that he got away from ingestion. We believe that once you hear all of this evidence, that you're going to find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty as charged, we ask you to be fair in your assessment of the evidence and to render that guilty verdict at the end of this trial. Thank you. Mr. Davis, thank you very much. Sir, Mr. Foreman, do you wish to make an opening statement at this time or do you wish to reserve? I would like to make an opening statement. You may proceed, Thank you. Once again, good morning.
they say that sort of speech, do you hear it? They say he had droopy eyelids. Do you see it? Does the camera ever pin it to his face close enough to be able to tell? Did they preserve this evidence that they are portraying to you today when they had every opportunity on the night of Mr. Dotson's arrest four years ago? Bloodshot eyes. Do you see that? Listen to what Mr. Dotson says on the video. Watch how he exits the vehicle. Watch how he moves. Watch how he walks. Watch how he talks. You will not see any or hear any evidence of impairment by any combination or not in this case. The Commonwealth is trying to, for lack of a better term, win this trial on a technicality. Well, technically, his blood has X, Y, Z. Therefore, your conclusion must be that he is guilty. And we have an expert and an officer to confirm our suspicions. But ignore what you're seeing and hearing. That, that's irrelevant. Just focus on the technicalities. Focus on the numbers that we're giving you. Focus on the testimony of biased, interested witnesses that we are giving you. But don't pay attention, don't listen, don't hear to the only independent, unbiased evidence in this case. So what happened on September 28, 2019? Mr. Timothy Dotson, a few hours prior to this stop, was with a friend at a gathering. Him and his buddy Peyton uh, <coughs> were hanging out with some friends. He consumed two Bud Lights and he took one puff of one marijuana cigarette hours before driving. Why? Because he knew that day he is the designated driver. He was the one that is going to be driving. It's his truck. He's the one who's going to be responsible for his buddy Peyton. So approximately two, two and a half, it's been a very long time ago, so I can't give you an exact time frame. But being the responsible individual that he is, he ceased all consumption of alcohol. He did not partake in any more marijuana smoking, although his friend may or may not have, we don't know. And then around 10, what was the exact time? Around 10, 20, 10, 15, about 10 minutes before they got pulled over. Uh, Mr. Dodson was driving the two of them to Taco Bell to get some food because they were hungry. And on the way there, as they were approaching the checkpoint, they passed the gas station where, at the time, Officer, now former Officer Salyer, was parked, just sitting at the gas station in front of this checkpoint. As they approach the checkpoint, his buddy starts freaking out. Like, man, we, we can't go through this checkpoint. We cannot go through this checkpoint. You, you, got, you got to turn. You got, you got to do something. So, Timothy says, okay, <coughs> all right. And he makes a turn into the side street. And Officer Salyer decides to follow him. He gets a little suspicious. Why is that vehicle not going through the checkpoint? Pulls the motor. The video that you will see does not commemorate in any way, shape, or form any driver, period, at all. All it commemorates in the video you 
begins at the moment when Officer Sellier is getting ready to exit, excuse me, his vehicle. That's literally the moment it begins. And there's like a 30 second delay, it's just standard stuff when they turn on the, their body camera. There's 30 seconds of silence and then you will begin to hear audio. So don't, don't, don't freak out when you realize there's no audio in the first 30 seconds. That's common. I do a lot of cases, I see it all the time. And you will hear a conversation between uh, a former officer cellular, Mr. Dotson, after he approaches Mr. Dotson's vehicle. Now again, for reasons that completely escape you, there's the wool over your eyes again. The Commonwealth knows they've seen the video. They're in the same boat as we are. There is another individual on scene <coughs> that's in the car, that is Payton. He's the passenger in the vehicle. They didn't even mention him once in their opening. Not one time. Why? Because to them, he's not an important party. He's one of the most crucial individuals in this whole case, and we'll get to why in a moment. The smell is coming from the vehicle. They said something about um, marijuana residue that was found. Number one, Mr. Dotson is not charged with possession of marijuana. Number two, we were never served with any type of evidence of marijuana. Um, you will hear testimony from former officer Salyer that he believed subjectively that he saw a bag or some sort of bag, I think he even says bag of marijuana or something like that. I don't know how you can deduce from passing by that you saw a bag of marijuana fly out the window that he saw them dump marijuana. He's going to go look for it. He never found anything. Because it doesn't exist. So he gets Mr. Dotson and Peyton out of the car, out of the truck. And he begins his usual routine of conducting standardized foot sobriety tests or exercises. It's, the, it's a technical term. And it is true, they are trained to see if they can see any type of indicia of intoxication, indicia of potential impairment. But here's the problem, and I anticipate Officer Salyer will testify to this. Those tests are obviously not foolproof. There is a margin of error. There is a percentage where sometimes you do the exercise and your results are incorrect, and that was a false positive. And sometimes your judgment as a subjective witness of what you are perceiving is already clouded by your bias, the potential perception of maybe a marijuana bag being thrown out, why you're avoiding a checkpoint. Well, you're obviously under something, I just got to figure out what it is. So your judgment <coughs> is clouded through this lens of bias, of guilt, as he is notating what is happening in front of him. But again, you will see Timothy Dotson walking as a sober person would, completely fine. The follow my finger test, you won't even get a chance to see because the officer did not hit at his camera to show you what he's doing. The clues that he's looking for were not preserved for you all. So that you can make an independent judgment on this unbiased video and make a judgment for yourselves as to what actually happened that night. You will see Mr. Dotson keep his foot in the air for 30 seconds. You will see him catch his balance, as a matter of fact, multiple times, nearly, nearly about this, nearly falling over and then catching himself and staying upright. 
Former officer Sellier even told him, I need you to lift it six inches. So he lifts it six inches. And he stays there, stationary. So, real quick, the charges. Uh, careless driving and failure to use a turn signal. We have no evidence other than former Officer Salyer's testimony. He's going to talk about it. Later. He's the only source of that information. Uh, oh, possession of an open container in the Wendy's cup. Wendy's is not your typical container of uh, maintaining your alcohol beverages, but I'm not here to judge. Uh, he will testify that he poured it out. He didn't preserve it for you all. He didn't bring it to court or a sample of it or something to at least kind of maybe, you know, so you could smell it and <coughs> of what he is telling you. And they're charging you with it. Again, another crime. These are not civil offenses as we talk about in jury selection. They're looking for a conviction. They're looking for jail time based on evidence that they are not even bringing to court because they destroyed it on the scene. And operating motor vehicle under the influence, which they have no evidence of other than, technically speaking, this is what we believe. This whole trial is going to be about, do you believe the technicalities that they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes? <coughs> or do you believe your own eyes and ears, what you see, what you hear, and what you uh, understand? 
based on what we're seeing, of the only independent, unbiased <coughs> evidence in this case. So after um, the truck is released again to an individual, to this day we don't know, he's not going to be coming in to testify today. I can tell you that right now. Why is he scared? He's scared he may be charged with operating a motor vehicle on an ambulance. If he gets up, he says, you know what? Yeah, maybe I was a little stoned. Uh, I have a designated driver. Bro, 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 bro. Yeah, if we're if we're not going to call him as a witness, let's not talk about okay, what I, I apologize. No, it, I just no apology okay. sustained. I will. Ladies and gentlemen, the jury is hereby um, admonished to disregard statements regarding what a witness who is not going to be called may or may not have testified to. Thank are you satisfied you. with the admonition, Mr. Davis? Yes, Mr. Foreman, are you satisfied, sir? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Dotson is placed in the back of former Officer Sellers' cruiser, and he is taken uh, to the hospital for a blood draw. Now, so far, <coughs> one thing I, I left off, I apologize, um, he was also breathalyzed on scene, and former Officer Sellers will say on video that it showed the presence of alcohol. And he will probably testify to the same effect, which we do not contest. <clears throat> the blood results we will see 0.069, and the marijuana, the three nanograms per milliliter. Their own expert, we anticipate, will testify that he cannot say with certainty that a certain number is correlated with impairment, because many, many studies have been done over the years. And there's not a single laboratory anywhere that can confirm <coughs> that if you have XYZ marijuana in your system equals impairment. Again, it, there, there's a distraction game. They're trying to distract you from the main event. Focus on the technicalities, don't focus on what you see in here. After Mr. Dotson is arrested, he's taken to the, uh, the hospital. As I've, as I've already said, he has, uh, he has been administered and conducted uh, multiple field sobriety tests, about four of them. And now there is a, a fifth one, if you will, submitting to a blood draw. He could have easily refused. He could have said, no, I am not giving you my blood. But he knew that he was sober to drive. He was the designated driver that he would be. He was being a responsible adult. He had nothing to hide. And he said, go ahead. Take my blood. You will see that on the video. You will also hear when the implied consent is read to Mr. Dotson. Actually, a very important document. To inform him of his rights, his right to refuse, his right to terminate, his right to so on and so forth. There is a child screaming at the top of his lungs in the next room. Officer Seller pays no mind to it, he just simply continues reading, unabated. Mr. Dotson's rights. Again, it just goes through the state of mind. He doesn't care. Just doing his job. Good enough for government work. <coughs> He's so careless, in fact, you will see on the video that the, I believe she was a doctor, because if I'm not mistaken, she's wearing a white coat. When she comes in to take um, Mr. Dotson's blood, she's wearing gloves, as she should, to protect any cross-contamination between her skin cells and uh, the blood that she's extracting. This is a bodily fluid that can be very easily contaminated with something that's in there. Former Officer Salyer is not even wearing gloves. <coughs> he's handling the same evidence. Yeah, okay. 
Yes, sir. Sir. How did you get to stipulate to the blood test and to the chain of custody and then argue that it's not effective? Yeah, have we, have we, we, I got we, an email. The only thing, yeah, I, I'm stipulating to the chain of custody, I'm stipulating to the blood results, but cross-contamination is just a simple thing that they're going to see on the video, Your Honor. There is nothing that I need to even point out. They're going to see it on the video themselves. Okay, so if... I, if, uh, my, well, I, I got this. So if you stipulate to the test, you don't get to sort of go back. And it's the only it, time it, I'm going to mention it, Your Honor. Well, I'm going to, you're not going to mention it. <laughs> well, you've mentioned it, but I'm going to admonish the jury. So I'm going to tell them that the, that the test have been stipulated to. Um, it, it, you know, you, 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 can't, it, you can't stipulate to the test and then attack the method upon which the test was administered. I just want them to pay attention to that in the video. That's all I do. Well, the, I'll let you say, watch how it was paid. Uh, watch how the, I'll let him say, watch how the test was administered. But that's it. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell them that as a matter of law, it's going to be uh, admitted and it's been uh, stipulated to. Okay? okay. You can say, watch how they do it. But, Thank you, Ron. All right. Any objection to that, Mr. Davis? Yeah. I mean, it, here all day and listen to you. So I, I would like the court just to simply just say to, to admonish. To, to admonish and that the test has been stipulated and it's valid. All right. It's probably cleaner. Go ahead. I do not intend um, for the rest of the trial to mention anything about the fact that I believe that the test results are invalid or inaccurate in any way. The officer's credibility and how good of a job he did is an issue here yeah. now. We're only going to have one lawyer at a time. It's either going to be all him, or uh, if that's the case, then we're going to let Miss Holland talk, and then you're uh, all of you are going to be in trouble. Okay. They're free to attack the officer on his duties and jobs, except for his performance as to the results and to the channel. Listen, I've, I've actually, you stipulate to it. We're not going to talk about it. We're going to play it and let him do it, okay? All right. Thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the test result in this matter, uh, in an effort to save everybody a little bit of time by the parties, have been stipulated to. As a matter of law, those will be admitted into evidence. Do you understand the admonition? Do you understand that the test is admit going to be admitted and there's, quote, nothing wrong with the, the, the way the test was administered? Do you all understand that? That's a stipulation. Are you satisfied with the admonition? Yes. Are you satisfied with the admonition? All right, go right ahead, sir. Just when you watch the video, pay attention. Pay attention to how the government employee is handling himself in evidence. Afterwards, uh, Mr. Dotson is taken to the jail. He's booked. And that is why you are here today. You have Mr. Dodson's freedom, Mr. Dodson's potential future criminal history, and Mr. Dodson's future in your hands. And again, I apologize for sounding like a broken record, <coughs> but this is what this case is about. The government simply wants you to focus on the technicalities, not reality. They want you to focus on biased witnesses that are going to contradict 
direct evidence that you're going to see and hear. So be prepared for that, because it's coming. Over the next, at least, uh, well, we're going to have a lunch in between, I imagine, but at least two and a half, maybe three hours, you're going to hear from former Officer Salyer, and you're going to hear from Mr. Mike Ward. They both have a vested interest in this case. They both work for the state. The video doesn't work for the state. So when this case is over, you know the fact to deliberate. I'm very confident that once you see and hear all of the evidence in this case, you will have no choice but to render a verdict of not guilty, not just for one of the charges, not for two of the charges, not for three of the charges, but every single one. Why? Because the Commonwealth cannot and will not be able to meet its burden. The highest burden in the land, beyond a reasonable doubt. Because again, you will see there is no evidence of driving, period, let alone using a signal, careless, reckless, whatever. The open container that could have been brought into court to show you has been destroyed. And you will not see impairment anywhere on Mr. Dotson throughout the video. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foreman. Commonwealth wish to call first witness. I do, Your Honor. Call Officer Sackett. Officer Sackett, can you please come around? I'm going to have that removed unless you want it moved over some, or do you want it? Where do you all want that? No, I'm going to approach Oh, sure. I never used the podium, so I don't know. Just have a moment to make sure the video is working. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and it should like, take five or ten minutes. I don't, I don't want to break with the jury. Okay. Uh, let, let's go ahead and set up. And take a, just you can't. You can, while they're doing that. Yeah, we'll, thank we'll you. Do that. I don't know if you want the video or the jury is watching the video. Oh, is it not set up? Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I've got okay. to plug in and make sure. We just tested it yesterday. No, no we'll, we'll be good. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to take a brief uh, kind of court uh, video prep break uh, to make sure this video is going to play correctly. So um, it's your duty not to uh, permit anyone to communicate with you uh, about any issue that is connected to this trial. Should anyone attempt to do so, uh, you are hereby directed to report that to me upon the return to the courtroom. Or courtroom. Additionally, you're not to talk amongst yourselves nor form or express any opinion on any issue that is connected to this case until I submit to this case to you for your deliberation. Does Commonwealth have any objection to that admonition? Counsel, do you have any objection to that admonition? But that being uh, said, let's see, it's 11.30. We'll come back at 11.40. We're adjourned.